Chapter 1. The Hiss Stop connecting with your darkness. Connect with the beauty of my risen life within you. You were on my heart eons before I created the galaxies and scattered a trillion suns across the void. I personally designed you and take great pleasure in the work of my hands. Pamela Reeve I hurled the phone across the kitchen where it banged against the wall just below the oven and clattered to the floor in pieces. Gathering my weary heart, I crossed to fetch it, bending to note the gash in the sheetrock where the phone had made contact. Ugh. The plastic notches wouldn't snap back in place, leaving random, unhooked wires and doobobs, and I was left with no ability to fix the conversation I had just botched. I laid the phone on the counter and covered it with a dish towel for the moment. Mercy. The phone hurling had come with good reason. My ministry-minded husband and ministry-minded me found our tidy world shattering. Our family of two beautiful teens was coming undone through an unexpected expectancy, substance abuse, and this, that, and the other unimaginable ordeal. Pain, pain, pain. And when a phone call came with more unraveling news, I came undone as well, and the phone went flying. It certainly wasn't the first time I had launched leftover turmoil far out and away. Oh, no. Frustrated flinging was familiar to me from times far back in my tumultuous childhood. Like a certain Halloween night as a teen growing up in Houston. Looking back, I still can't see into my motivation— I'm not sure where I got the eggs, or for heaven's sake, why I thought it would be cool to hurl them here and there. What I do remember is my hula girl costume, my finger on the doorbell, my body darting back down the front walk to hide behind some bushes, the door opening, and then my arm arching, launching a raw egg through the opening. Splat! It hit the target of the entryway, creating an artwork of egg yolk on the avocado and cream-flocked wallpaper. I can still see the stunned look of the owner's face. First shock, then confusion, and then anger. My trick-or-treating companion in crime, really just trick in this circumstance, rose from her hiding spot and we took off, praying our costumes would sufficiently conceal our identities. When I consider the less-than moments in my life, (laughs) this one usually starts the list. The list is long. Other teen follies follow. Smoking down at the bio, sneaking champagne at a wedding reception and having to be carried home by my date, slipping a lipstick into my purse at the mall, riding atop a friend's car hood at youth group, shoving my drunk mother in the doorway to get her out of my face— There are adult infractions, when surely I should have been more mature, slamming the refrigerator door over and over again until the shelf arms broke and glass jars rattled onto the floor, ignoring an inconvenient need in a co-worker, yelling at my husband and at my kids and God, throwing the phone across the room after ending that exasperating call. Of course, there are many more failings. Rather than trot out all the ugliness, let me just admit it here. I've messed up. I've sinned. Let me make that present tense. I mess up. I sin. And like everybody else, I cover up. I grab whatever fig-leafed excuse I can reach and put it in place over my mess. I tighten the drawstring on my grass hula skirt and I flee the scene. I cover plastic phone parts with a dish towel and slide to the kitchen floor. And then I try to function as if I'm okay, confident, whole, loved, when I truly don't believe I am. Because I know what's underneath the cover-up. I know what's still stinkily there. Enter the Hiss. From the time he was about three, my grandson Marcus would spend the night every other weekend or so, One bedtime, cuddled with him in his race car bed in his upstairs Marcus room, I reached for a book a friend had suggested to me in my newish grandmothering role, The Jesus Storybook Bible by Sally Lloyd-Jones. There was something so whimsically engaging about the art and the layout that I had tucked it up on the bedside table to open more fully with Marcus. I picked it up. It began, 
God wrote, I love you. He wrote it in the sky and on the earth and under the sea. He wrote his message everywhere because God created everything in his world to reflect him like a mirror, to show us what he is like, to help us know him, to make our hearts sing the way a kitten chases her tail, the way red poppies grow wild, the way a dolphin swims. I was liking this. Marcus was, too. We exchanged a smile, and I continued on through the story of creation. Hello, stars, God said. Hello, sun. Hello, moon. And whizzing into the darkness came fiery globes spinning around and around, whirling orange and purple and golden planets. You're good, God said, and they were. Marcus was now wide awake and eager for more of this story. I glanced at the clock, getting late, and then turned the page to the terrible lie. Curious, I caved and continued. Adam and Eve lived happily together in their beautiful new home, and everything was perfect for a while, until the day when everything went wrong— God had a horrible enemy. His name was Satan. He wanted to stop God's plan, stop this love story right there, so he disguised himself as a snake and waited in the garden. As soon as the snake saw his chance, he slithered silently up to Eve. Does God really love you? The serpent whispered. If he does, why won't he let you eat the nice, juicy, delicious fruit? Poor you, perhaps God doesn't want you to be happy. The snake's words hissed into her ears and sunk down deep into her heart like poison. Does God love me? Eve wondered. Suddenly, she didn't know any more, And a terrible lie came into the world. It would never leave. It would live on in every human heart, whispering to every one of God's children, God doesn't love me. I read on a bit further, who wants to go to sleep on that note, and then I marked our place, closed the book, and snuggle prayed with Marcus until he fell asleep. Downstairs in my own bed, the hiss stung my ears. Today, it stings still. God doesn't love me. To look at me, you wouldn't think I would dance to this beat. I seem confident in who I am and clear about what God has placed me on this planet to accomplish— But beneath my smiling greeting, my kind offer, my outstretched arms, the lie slithers. It undoes my doing. It pricks my confidence. It erases my perception of beauty and whizzes a lie of ugly in place of the twinkly hope that maybe I could somehow be okay, even loved. God knows this. He knows that I've heard the hiss. God does not love me and that I have believed it that because I've believed the hiss, I do not see myself the way God sees me. He understands that this great lie is what beckons me in and out of each day, away from him and all he offers. How are you? Someone asks. Inside, my reply gurgles up, ugly. In response, I reach for the fig leaf covering and offer some words, oh, pretty good, a throw rug over a stain on the carpet. Made in the image of God, beautiful. Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed before the lie was ever told and received. They heard the hiss, believed the lie into disobedience, and became ashamed. With their hearts twisted by untruth and their trust diminished by doubt, their beauty became defiled. Ugly entered. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Genesis 3, verse 7. A temporary covering, a fragile facade, the best they could manage with their limited abilities. In their book, The Cure, John Lynch, Bruce McNichol, and Bill Thrall pronounced, Here is the lie in two parts. We do not see God as He is, and we do not see ourselves as we are. Exactly. The hiss continues in each of us as the curse is handed down. Pain in childbirth, confusion in the relationship between husband and wife, sweaty work for survival. Eventual death, Genesis 3, verses 14 through 19. Our failures followed by God's rejection forever. We're sentenced with a kind of vision impairment, our inability to see ourselves the way God sees us. And then the tender irony, God created clothes for his embarrassed image bearers. After the lie's original hiss, God does not love you, 
God bent and fashioned the first fashion. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Genesis 3, verse 21. Isn't that stunning? God himself clothes his wayward ones. The God who x-ray visions through any cover-up we concoct yields to our need to hide and covers us himself. Although the fall caused clear consequences of separation for Adam and Eve, God's love for them does not change. What changes at the fall is their understanding of God's love and their ability to grasp that he still sees them as good, even beautiful, as does ours.